thank you all for coming. You have a lot of fans here. So uh, I, I, this might be a little too obvious, but usually when I try with, when I start off with my interview, I want to go with the background. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, where are you from? Like, what, what did your parents do? So my dad worked for the U.S. government. He worked in engineering and operations. Uh, the easy way to understand what he did was he was an efficiency expert. And for, for what agency? Uh, most of his career was with the United States Postal Service. No negative comments, please. <laughs> Um, and my mom worked in retail for most of her life. The entrepreneur side of what I've done comes from most of the rest of my family. So I've had great-grandfather and grandfather and other uncles and cousins. So I've had many members of my family that have been entrepreneurs. So that's where that particular part of what I do and what I love comes from. So what was your first entrepreneurial, uh, let's call it, uh, your first entrepreneurial, uh, I want to say shindig, but uh, your gig is what I'm looking for, gig. So I was very fortunate um, growing up in Iowa. I lived just outside of a state park, and there were actually 100 homes on that side of the, of the park, and it formed a community there. Half of them were summer homes or weekend homes, and half of them were permanent homes. The people there needed different services, so they needed their dogs walked, or they needed babysitting, or they needed their homes taken care of when they were going to be away for the winter or go on vacation or different things things like that. There were elderly that needed homes cleaned. There was one woman whose husband traveled on business a lot and she was afraid to stay home alone. So being the resourceful and responsible 12 year old that I was, I decided, hmm, I could get paid for this. And so from 12 years old until 17 years old, I ran a personal services company. That was my, my first experience with entrepreneurship. So I got paid for doing things like going and being somebody's companion because they were afraid to be home alone or taking care of people's dogs, yay, or cats, yay. <gasps> Um, doing things like, you know, watching and, and babysitting kids and, and getting paid to have play ball and have fun with people's kids and cleaning homes and those sorts of things. So it provided for me some funds that allowed me to, you know, get the clothes that I wanted or, or pay for the school supplies that I needed or those sorts of things or, or even just put a little bit of money in the bank. Then I had a small venture in college that was an editing business, so I helped people with their research papers. My guarantee was that I could raise you a grade if I edited your paper, so I made that guarantee and was very successful at that. So I've had different ventures. Um, I've had different business partners on ventures over the years, so I've always had some sort of a side gig. And for... Oh, my goodness, I can't even think how many years now. I think it's 2007 I started then my side consulting business that I have. And I've almost always had a job along with running my own businesses. So the side consulting gig allowed me to help nonprofits and to do pro bono work for clients who couldn't afford to pay. So I got my bills covered from the job and then was able to do what spoke to my heart by picking and choosing a few clients that I wanted to work with on the side consulting. That's a great job. That's a, I like that, being able to help out the other people on the side. So before you were at, uh, at Sac State, you were at the University of North Iowa. Um, and you had two roles there. You were the, the associate director of the, at the entrepreneurship and the, um, uh, the intellectual property. So I, I'm just basically, I guess, uh, in terms of your role as the IP officer, what, uh, what are some, you know, what's the advice that you have in terms of IP for early stage startups? So first off, um, what I frequently find when folks are attending, for example, an intellectual property workshop that I wind up doing is people confuse the different forms of intellectual property. Many new startups confuse the different forms of intellectual property. So a lot of times people will say of a visual identity or a phrase or something, ooh, I'm going to copyright that. No. Copyright is for things like books or song scores, or paintings that you do. So it's a visual expression, or it's a tangible expression in a tangible medium. That's what copyright is. 
if you come up with a tagline or a slogan or a, a, a logo, those sorts of things, you're going to trademark those. That's the difference. So understanding your terminology and what the different forms of protection are becomes very important. Patents, there's patents. Patents are for physical objects, so it could be a manufacturer or a process or um, different forms of, so there are about five different areas in patents, but it's almost always something tangible or process oriented can be patented. We copyright software because it's written code. And then we can trademark the name of our company or we can trademark our tagline. So understanding the different forms of intellectual property becomes very important, especially in a startup. Understanding what they are and understanding when you need to use them because all of the different forms, trade secret, trademark, copyright, and patent, all can work hand in hand, but you need to understand why you're using them in your business and when you should be using them in your business. So a lot of startups I, I work with, they're, I mostly work in technology and they're interested in um, patents. Is this something, uh, in terms of, is there any advice you'd give for a, an early stage startup? And when I say early stage, it's like a founder, maybe a co-founder, in terms of getting a patent. Is it something that's really worthwhile or should they just work an idea and not spend the time and energy on trying to get the patent. So all intellectual property, including patents, should be a strategic decision in your business. You need to understand why you are going to patent something or why you are going to trademark it or any of the other stuff as opposed to just sort of doing it because it's an option. I am not a person that says everything should be patented. I want you to understand why you're going to patent. What does it get you? What are you doing to protect? Why do you need to protect what it is that you're protecting? So you may have a reason to want a patent in your business, but there may be an equally valid reason not to patent something in your business. Understand also that patents and the patent process does take time. I mean, it's not, it's not going and being and it's done in 24 hours. It takes a lot more time than that. And there is great cost associated with it. Many entrepreneurs don't have the ability to write the claims and the other types of things that go into actually patenting in the correct terminology. And there is correct terminology and correct form that actually patent applications have to be filed in, and most entrepreneurs don't have that. That's why you're paying a patent attorney, an intellectual property officer, for that particular knowledge for them to do those particular filings for you. So I want you to think about why do I need this patent in my business? Do I need to protect this or is there a reason I could just go straight to market and start making sales and establish the name of my product or my company as being the thing in the marketplace that is important and that everybody associates with this? So you need to weigh those protections. You need to make those decisions strategically. You know, and I think you've worked with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs at early stage entrepreneurs. In fact, I met, I've talked to a few here. Um, so what is your advice for the, the person that has that, you know, the, the, so they have that great idea that they could be the next Uber. What is your advice to that, uh, that uh, inspiring entrepreneur? It's not about the idea. There's your newsflash. It's not about the idea. It's truly about execution. So it is, so I love the work of Angela Duckworth. Y'all should read it if you have not read the work of Angela Duckworth. One of her concepts is the concept of grit. And she writes a book called Grit. So what that means is the ability of the entrepreneur to go every day and do the work every single day and work their way through it. Grit is extremely important. We could call it perseverance or whatever other term we want to put to that. But grit, perseverance, traction, those sorts of things, working the work, doing the work, becomes extremely important for the entrepreneur. That's what leads to success. I will always take a mediocre idea with a really great team that's willing to work really hard. And that will usually lead to success because there's been a lot of great ideas with mediocre teams who don't really want to work that fall by the wayside. So, so <clears throat> what, you know, they have the great idea and let's just say they have grit. What, what are the first few steps you think they, you know, they need to do in, in forming, you know, taking their idea to market? 
So let's do a show of hands right here. How many of you, when you came up with your great idea, actually went and talked with people, did customer discovery? Yay. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, please go do some customer discovery. So it is not about... So, just, just, so how many people, like uh, the Big Bang Theory, mm -hmm. or, Big Bang, the Big Bang Competition has a step in there where they have to talk to, they want you to talk to 20 customers. What, what's, is that about right or do you think it should be, what do you think? No. So where I came from in our, uh, one of the programs that we used to run at Northern Iowa was called Venture School. And we had a minimum of 100 people that you needed to talk to as part of that program with regard to your idea, ideally more than that. What you'll start to see is that about 40 to 50 people, you'll start to hear some of the same things coming around. You'll start to, things will start to solidify and it'll start to give you a little bit of direction for what you're doing. 20 people, 20 people is not enough. And especially if those 20 people are your friends, family members, or other people who love you. Because all they're gonna do, is validate your idea for you and you don't want that. What you want to do is talk to people who are not you, who are not your family members. You want to get out and talk to as many folks with as much diversity and difference of, of ideas and opinions as you possibly can. That's when you're going to figure out if you've got a valid idea. Well, yeah, and I interrupted you if you want to talk about the other steps. Sorry, I interrupted you. So. So customer discovery, first, foremost, most important. So you create, so we, what we do is we actually use the scientific method. So how many of you are familiar with scientific method? Remember way back in science class? Yep. So what we wind up doing is we create a hypothesis. That hypothesis is what's the pain in the market, the problem that we want to solve. That's what we go and talk to people about in the first stage, trying to understand in, in, in as broad a way as possible, what people are experiencing as that pain, that will help guide us to what our potential solution can be. So we are constantly going and talking to people in the early stages of a startup about what's the pain and what's the potential solution. You need to have conversations with folks. It's gonna be very, very important. That's how you create the business because newsflash folks, your business is not about you. Your business is about serving the people who are going to be your customers. And the only way you do that is by understanding what their problems are and providing the solution that way. So customer discovery to alleviate the market pain with a solution that's going to work for the most people. That's how we make a successful business. So one of the, especially here in Sacramento, in dealing with the startups that the, um, many startups I talked to, one of the biggest challenges they have is, uh, is their initial funding. What advice do you give for them in, in raising, in doing their fundraise? Wow. Um, so I do a whole workshop on funding. Um, it's a tough thing. Funding is a really hard thing. Um, oftentimes entrepreneurs, when they're first starting out, are looking at bootstrapping your own savings. So if you're thinking of, of being an entrepreneur, start setting your own money aside. A little forethought there. Bootstrapping, you know, being efficient with what you're doing and making some sales and putting that money back into the business. Maybe you hold on to your job for a little while if you've got a job and you do the other, the, the new business on the side till you can grow it to a certain point. I know I talked to a few people tonight that are doing that. That's exactly smart. Eventually, you're probably going into the three Fs friends, family, and fools. <laughs> so those are the folks from whom you can get money in the early stage. One of the things to be aware of is generally friends and family money most of the time is probably going to be a loan, maybe equity, but could be a loan. There is, of course, the gift, the one-time gift allowance that folks can make you every, every year so they can actually give you cash. I think it's 15000 for 2019. So that's another option of funding for you, but understand, and here's a big mistake a lot of new entrepreneurs make when they're first starting out. That loan that you get from your family member, you need to structure it just like a loan. Otherwise, the Internal Revenue Service will do what's called imputed interest. They will assign an interest rate and they will treat it like a loan. So it's really important that if a family member wants to be generous and do a loan to help your business, you need to treat it like a loan. It doesn't matter that Aunt Sally is wanting to help you. Aunt Sally is now your lender. 
So you need to structure it in a form with a note payable, with actual payment schedule, the whole bit like that, so that it looks and is above board. Eventually, you might get to the point where you're looking at equity, and there are different forms of equity that are out there. So there's certainly angels, which we've all heard of. Angels tend to be the largest group of investors across the United States, but they give in smaller amounts of money. So they're oftentimes the earlier stage of investment. Then you get into other types of structured groups. So you have maybe regional angel investor networks, where groups of angels have formed together and have a little more paperwork and a little more due diligence and a little more review and, and can give a little more money. Then you go all the way up through the different forms of funding, clear up into the VC level and stuff. So you need to understand the landscape of what's going on, that there are different folks that are going to come into your business at different stages and different levels that are going to have the ability to give you what you need in your business. But here's the catch. So I actually brought my, my flaws list that I'll I go see that. over. So I'm happy to go over those for you. But one of the things that you have to remember, and it's on my flaws list when seeking investment, you need to have a business, not just a product. Investors invest in businesses. They have to have a business to invest in. They don't just invest in products. Would you like me to go through my flaws list quickly? Yes, please. Brought them for y'all. All right, so here's our flaws list. This is my list of pitch mistakes. So here you go, here's your wisdom. And I must say, some of these are mine, but some of these are from some brilliant colleagues that I have. So thanks to Sandra and Jim, I've totally stolen your stuff too and added it to my list. Always steal from the best if you're gonna steal. So thanks to Sandra and Jim, here we go. Pitching when the company is not ready. You need to be ready. And pitching too early to an investor, there's, it's, you can't be so early, whoops, thank you. You can't be so early that you have nothing but an idea. You have to have something that's more akin to a business. So you may be pitching to multiple investors and having them see you grow over time but you need to have the business. So don't pitch when it's just a basic idea. That's what pitch competitions are for, to help you refine that. Pitching to the wrong investor. Understand investors have preferences on what they will fund. And all of the equity investors I know all have preferences on what they fund. The, the equity fund I used to manage back in Iowa had preferences on what they would and would not fund. Not having a clear, concise, and compelling pitch. Rambling on is not good. They want a clear, concise, and compelling pitch. So definitely work with somebody who can help you get that refined. Go to many of the pitch competitions that we offer here in the area. So there's some really good ones that are going to help that. You need to have an exit in mind. An investor does not want to come into your company and be in it forever and ever and ever. They want to get in, they want you to grow and be successful, and then they want to be able to get out. They don't want to become your lifelong partner. Here's one of my personal favorites that I really just sort of groan when I hear. I only need 1% of the market. That says that you haven't really done your research, your customer discovery, to figure out who your customer is and how big that prospective market of customers is. So do not say, I only need 1% of the market. Be able to give real numbers on who your customers are. So a lot of that is just theoretical. So, you know, and I've seen these pitches where they, you know, they have these, uh, you know, they've got like this bar graph, mm -hmm. but I know that that's all theoretical. Like it, and I guess the question is, where do you get these numbers? Or do they, I mean, I, as an investor, I would just know that they're just making stuff up, or at least they're trying to. So do you remember about 10 minutes ago when I said customer discovery? That's where you're getting your real numbers from. So having conversations with people and doing your customer discovery. Yes, we're going to use secondary data and those sorts of things that says, there are this many people in the United States that do this. There are this many people in the United States that use this. That's all fine. But what you want to be able to say is, I talked with 200 people about this, and they told me this. I talked with 300 people. 
I talked with this many people. Those are real people. And actually pulling information out from what they say and helping guide you is going to be really important, too. So it's a combination of using the stats, but also a combination of showing that you've actually done the real legwork to get out there and have real conversations so that your numbers are more valid. So if, if you're doing the, let's say, the hiring person discovery, and you could say maybe 30% of the people would be willing to pay for it, that's where you translate that number? Is that, is that the gist of it? So one of the things about willing to pay for it is you've got to ask the right question. We call this the ugly baby problem. So if, say, I'm trying to sell you that bottle of water, if I say, wouldn't you really love to have this lovely bottle of water, you're going to tell me that you want to have that lovely bottle of water because you don't want to upset me, you want us to like each other, those sorts of things. You're not going to tell me my baby is ugly. The same sort of thing happens with your products if you approach people by asking them if they want to buy that. So what you ask them are instead are better questions. If you've done your customer customer discovery right, you know what they want, therefore you can ask them pricing questions about what price level they would wind up paying for the thing they've already told you it is that they want. It's a better way to approach it. If you're trying to do the sales, and we don't want to do that, if you're trying to do the sales, then people are just going to validate what it is that you're asking them, and it's not going to translate to real dollars for your business. That's actually good advice. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gee, well, no, I, I'm actually working with a client right now, and uh, he, uh, you know, that's that's where they're at at the discovery mm -hmm. stage, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was just thinking they should just ask, would you be willing no. to pay for it? No. How much would you pay for it? That's a better question. So I actually use four questions that are called the Van Westendorp pricing matrix questions. Van Westendorp, W-E-S-T-E-N-D-O-R-P. Van Westendorp. And they're brilliant questions that he developed way back in the 1970s, and they're still valid today. And it basically does for you is it puts a price ceiling, what's out of range, it puts a floor, what's too cheap, and then it gives you the optimal price point right there in the middle. And by the way, 100 people is not enough to talk to. You need more than 100. So we start with 100 to validate our concept. We're going to continue to have conversations with different groups of people as we're continuing to grow this particular business. So batches of people we're going to want to talk to about pricing, not necessarily just the same people we've already talked to to validate the concept. Okay. Uh, a couple of other things for the, the fatal flaws in pitching. Everybody needs my. Do not ever say everybody needs my. So if you're selling water or if you're selling air, then yes, everybody needs what it is that you're selling. But other than that, if you say everybody needs my, you don't understand your market. So you need to be able to understand your market. I have no competitors goes the same way. So you may not have any direct competitors, but you are going to have some sort of indirect competitor, a substitution or a way that people are solving that problem right now. So do be careful with that. Failing to state the pain, the real problem in the market that you're solving. Believe it or not, you have to be pretty clear about that. Here's another great one. You need to be able to say how the company is going to make money. An investor's not going to invest in you if they don't know how you're going to make money. Because if you don't make money, they don't make money. And then there are a couple of others, but the last one, as I said, building a business is important, not just building product or service. I think I failed to mention, May is actually Female Founder Month. Yes. And um, so I guess the question I have is you have suggestions for female founders. So I actually, so I actually do, and I didn't want to forget a couple of them, so I jotted down a couple of notes. One of the things I've always found particularly useful is forming networks with other women. I, I find that that camaraderie and working through a startup that way really helps. And so I, there are female founder networks here in the area, and there are some really cool female founders here in the area. So definitely um, get involved in your female networks if you're a female founder. Actually, events like this are great for everybody. So entrepreneurs with entrepreneurs is definitely going to help. 
My experience has been as both a female founder and um, oftentimes the only woman in a particular organization is that I usually have to work, uh, I usually have to work harder, I usually have to work better, I usually have to work smarter. So it's just the reality. Oftentimes I have to work just a little longer. And then finally, the last thing that would be, if I'm giving you three pieces of advice, keep your cool. Very important. So I always try to approach most situations. I fail miserably, of course, but hey, what can I say? We all fail, right? You aspire, right? So I aspire every day to, um, to, to operate with both dignity and grace. And so that's why I say keep my cool. So there's a lot of stuff when you're an entrepreneur that can wind up upsetting you, but you just try to take a breath and operate with dignity and grace. Uh, are there any uh, Sacramento startups that you've been working with that uh, you know that you find have a have a good potential? So anybody want to raise their hand in here? <laughs> I've got several of my students in here that are actually doing some great stuff, and um, yeah, so. I, I'm going to point out one right here in front. I'm going to Adrian there. Give a, give a raise, Adrian. So, Adrian right here in front is doing Town Today. And Adrian, so there were 104 entrants in UC Davis Big Bang competition this year. Adrian made it into the top 15. That's pretty impressive. Will town today soar and be great? I can't say that. But do I know for a fact that Adrian will soar and be great? I do know that. Yay. So Dom sitting here on the other end, just next to Adrian, say, hey, Dom. All right, so Dom here is another one of my students. He's in the middle of what we call market tests right now, learning lots of lessons every day. It for his, he's got a lifestyle um, and luxury brand. So he does watches and some clothing and, and trench coats and some stuff like that. So Dom is doing market tests right now and we're learning a lot of things. Can I say that Dom's current business, DiMaggio, is gonna, his line is gonna be absolutely successful? No. Can I say that Dom is learning a lot that it will inspire him to be an entrepreneur and other future stuff? Yes. So for me, it's about, and always has been, about being able to teach the students and let them learn this process and how to analyze and evaluate. Because if it doesn't work now, that process still works for every other business that they want to try. So understanding the process is extremely important. My not Sacramento business, but I did invite them here today, and one of them that is doing great guns, we're now three years old, woohoo! They're sitting at the back of the room trying to hide back there, <laughs> is go to science. And they do some incredible stuff in pre K through two, teaching scientific methodology to young people and getting them to love and enjoy science. And the business is now three years old. So for those of you who are in this industry, you know that if you can hit the three-year mark, that usually that's a pretty good sign because a lot of businesses will fall out before they hit the three-year mark. So three to five years, really important marks in business. 10 years is when you start to have some real traction, you start to make some real money, you kind of know what you're doing. So. So that's what you're aiming to. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't tell you guys that yet. You're now learning that. You guys still have, you know, you've got seven more years to go. Sorry. So three to five years is when most businesses will either sail or sink. Any, any others you want to point out? I have Frank here who's just starting with a couple of different concepts and exploring. I've got Niche. There you are, sweetheart. I've got Niche back there who is doing and just got a contract with North Highlands Rec to do, yay, to do, thank you for, I didn't see her, thank you for doing that, um, who is doing art and helping art be therapeutic. And so, and creating, are we still calling it cultural capital creative? Right now it's a culturally creative art program. Thank you. 
And she is doing that this summer with North Highlands Rec and offering many of those. So she, she's definitely exploring the model. She just graduated Sac State this Woo. And then I have Derek sitting back here who wants to get into consulting, but he's going to go and work for some people first to get a little experience. Woo, that's a great thing, to get a little experience under his belt so that he's got more traction when he decides he wants to he go He does consulting. have the look of a consultant, though. He does. I think it's the glasses. He's a numbers guy. A numbers guy. You all want numbers, guys. They're really important. So everybody, you should talk to Derek at the end and get him to start helping you. Numbers are really, really important in your business. I think those are all my students. Did I miss anybody? So I appreciate all of them coming. This is, this is why I do what I do. I love my students. I always thank you. OK, so actually, that's it for my questions. I'm going to go open it up to the, the audience right now. Anyone? This is why I spoon feed you all. I give you only the info that you need at the time that you need it. If I had told you when you first started it was going to be 10 years, you wouldn't have even started. That's the itch. There you go. Seven to 10 years, actually. Seven to 10 years is actually right. So three to five is usually when you'll see stuff fall out and not make it. So anything below that definitely is going to fall out. Three to five, usually you're going to have a little bit more traction and be able to live. Once you hit your seven to ten years, then generally if you don't do anything really stupid. <laughs> We're just getting you guys to the next hurdle, right? So you guys have an incredible amount of potential here. Have you seen all of the organizations that you have to serve entrepreneurs throughout the entire range of what you're doing? That is incredibly exciting. I didn't have that where I came from. Um, we sort of had to put that together on a whole statewide level. You guys have all of the stuff you need here in one location. Then good. Good. So it's, really, so it's really important then that everyone cooperate. And I, I'm a big fan of cooperation. So you may be competitors, but I want you cooperating. Cooperation is really good. So technically competitors, but choosing to work together. Very important. Important in business oftentimes, and certainly important in the work of an e building an ecosystem. You know, the other thing I'm seeing is that there's some... Um Entrepreneurs that have been successful, and uh, they have had some exits, and they're starting to give back both through mentorship and investment back to the community here. That is huge. So it's really important for new entrepreneurs to see entrepreneurs in a particular ecosystem or a particular community that have been successful and that they've got enough interest to come back into that community and reinvest in that community. That's huge. Very, very important. Wow. Um, you know, a lot of that niche is going to depend upon your business model and the way that you structure that and what you wind up doing. My take has always been you should do what your business is because you love it, not because you can make a lot of money. There are, of course, people who are going to disagree with me, but my take has always been get up in the morning because you want to get up and you're excited to go do that, and that's what should drive you. The side benefit is if you make a lot of money. Are there things you can go do and make a lot of money? Yeah. So you could certainly focus on those. 
I can't say whether you will or you will not make a lot of money. I don't know because there's so many variables to being able to do that and so many decision points along the way. So it's going to depend upon a, a number of things that you wind up doing. But you have to understand why you got into doing what you're doing. And I know you didn't do it to start off making a lot of money. You did it because of your love of children, your love of creating family, and your love of art. Are there any books that you find yourself recommending over and over? There are definitely some books. I should have written those down on my list. I'll see what I can remember off the top of my head. So take a look at the work of Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, out of Stanford. She's got some great stuff on mindset, on the innovation mindset. It's really good. Carol is great. Angela Duckworth, her book on grit, is also excellent. I find myself reading a lot of Daniel Pink. I find myself reading a lot of um, Bowman and Deal. I find myself reading, oh my goodness. I, I, so here's the thing about being an entrepreneur. It actually benefits you to read everything because you're going to pick up nuts and bolts and little bits and tidbits and stuff from all of that. So reading everything is really important. One of the other ones that is of particular interest to me, and you're going to be surprised by this, it's actually a communication thing, but one of my um, advanced degrees is in communications because communications is really essential in being a good business owner and an entrepreneur. So one of them that's really important is I find that it's called humble inquiry. Humble inquiry, and that is, um, I want to get it right, let's see, Edgar Schein, I believe. And that is about asking people rather than telling people. So making the conscious choice whenever possible to ask somebody something rather than tell. So it, it looks like Rich and I were having a conversation. I would say, what do you know about? And then he would tell me what he knows about that. What that allows us to do is to then start from that point and have the conversation rather than me talking at him, lecturing him about information he already knows. That is an, an insulting way to approach a conversation with someone. So humble inquiry, starting off by finding out what that person already knows about what you're going to talk about, creates better conversation because then it puts you both on the same plane for conversation. So I'm a big fan of humble inquiry. Is there a time and a place for lecture? Certainly. I mean, you know, I used to work at a university, so hello, we do that oftentimes. The other time and place for lecture or talking at someone is if somebody's hair is on fire or something like that. So there's certainly emergency situations where you're going to do that. But most of the time, approaching conversation as if it's conversation as opposed to talking. So I always use this. Don't talk at someone. Talk with someone. So I am familiar with Guy's work, and I do have some different books by Guy. Guy speaks to some people. Um, I'm fine with his message. He doesn't particularly personally resonate strongly with me, but I do know that many of my students have found great messages in Guy. So all good. Have you, did you ever have someone that you're looking at and made you want to be a business Like, who was your inspo? Um, actually... It was probably uh, Jackie. I'm not going to give her last name. And she's dead now, anyway. Um, but she owned a bar. And she ran a bar. And she was a beautiful, tiny little woman and very strong and independent and raised her son as a single mom. And she was just a great person. And I'm like... I, I really like her, and I like who she is as a person, and so it wasn't so much about her being a business owner, but more about who she was as a person, and I've been very fortunate in my life being surrounded by an incredible number of women that have taught me all kinds of things about being a, a great woman, and I've learned a lot of lessons from, so could I pinpoint one 
Probably not, but I'm going to pick Jackie right now because she was such an early influencer, but, but I've found lots of people throughout my life. And so part of it is I approach interactions with everybody, and this is kind of a key. I approach my interactions with everyone in that I believe everyone has something to teach us. And so every interaction with someone, I'm trying to learn whatever it is that they want to teach me, whatever knowledge they want to give me. And so when you approach everybody open and, and, and putting them in that position of being an expert about something, it tends to lead not only to your learning something, but it leads to a better relationship with someone. So back at my old university, the, the group of angels in our area decided that they wanted to create a regional angel investor network. And the structure for those had just sort of been solidified, and we'd actually received a, a model for how to develop these. And so we created the first one in the state of Iowa. It was Cedar Valley Venture Fund. We created that, and I managed that particular fund for the 37 investors that were in that fund. I'm sorry, the rest of, oh, how did it differ? Okay, so what wound up happening is what became obvious after other funds, regional angel investor network funds were established throughout the state, I was the one everyone called first to find out if Cedar Valley Venture Fund would give them an investment for whatever their business idea was. And they did that for two reasons. I was the only female on the primary list of contacts for all of the funds. And so one of the assumptions was, well, I must be nicer and kinder and, and I don't know. I, I'm going to even go with maybe more stupid and didn't know how to make a good deal or something. I don't know. So they made the assumption that I was not going to be as tough or hold them to the same sorts of standards that the men who were managing the other funds were going to wrong assumption. But being that I work with founders, what I wound up finding myself doing was I was conflicted. So the mom in me and the teacher in me wound up saying, no, our fund can't, can't uh, you know, do an investment in you. You're not in our investment criteria and blah, 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 you know, and you're not in the types of stuff we invest in. However, let me give you a little bit of advice and knowledge. And so then I would flip to the teacher side and the educator side because I was so used to working with entrepreneurs. And I would tell them how to approach the other funds and which other funds to approach and, and sort of give them some education on how to do that. So it's a bit of a conflict for me on both sides. But I think I, I think I did okay. But I had to do that for me. So I couldn't just couldn't be just totally hard line. It's just not in me. My question is, um, I've heard, um, having conversations, so we've been in business 10 years, um, made it, <laughs> uh, but um, we were women-owned business last year, uh, the second one of us, BA, but, um, and so we want to create... I think you're a, what the woman of the year business, woman-owned yeah, business woman of the year. Business. I have to give you a shout out. Thank you. <laughs> services we help organizations plan for respond to and recover from disaster we want to create a SaaS model planning platform and in conversations with a number of you know folks in the, the investor community I've been hearing back and forth and I want to hear your thoughts so I'm talking to a couple of people people have said SaaS model that's not investable which is interesting you know because it's it's a service and it's not really investable but products, it's a, essentially, in my, my view, a product. So I just want to hear what you thought. Okay. I know investors that that's their primary goal is SaaS models. So you're going to talk to 100 different investors, and you're going to have 100 different opinions. So that guy's opinion, I think, is a little off. <laughs> oh, I think I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, he doesn't have a thesis. Rich is, rich is spot on. So it's about, finding, it's about finding the right investor for what it is that you're doing. So always look at it as 
with an investor, you're sort of creating a marriage. It's about getting the right partners together. And all investors have different preferences. They have preferences for what they'll invest in, the way they're going to structure that investment, what they want out of that investment. There are some universals, though. They are investing because they want to make money. So your ability to show them that your SaaS model will make them money becomes important. The, you need to show them. So here's the gist. This is what we're selling. This is to whom we're selling. This is how we're selling it. And this is how we make money. Those things, if you can do those things for an investor, then the right investor, where you, what you're offering matches their investment, uh, their investment preferences, if you can do those things, then it should be a good marriage. Thank you. Um, is there any kind of a place that you would recommend or tools that you would recommend for uh, starting entrepreneurs that aren't necessarily looking for funding but are looking for like places where they can find community and guidance in similar fields? Um, and I guess this is for both of you, but any kind of resources that you would recommend on that? So I definitely recommend Startup Grinds. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely recommend One Million Cups. I definitely recommend getting on Startup Sacks and get on their newsletter mailing list. It's called the Startup Digest. And there you go. I definitely recommend then as you're starting single, even if you don't have your idea yet, there are a lot of really good workshops that are going on in this area. Start going to those because those are going to help you for the process. So I've done for my students, I've done boot camps, but that was only the first of many types of trainings that they were going to do and that they need. So just the constant re-exposure to things is going to help solidify that in your mind. So you don't, you don't do one one workshop on the business model canvas and being you're a master and you've got it down, it might take multiple times of learning that particular thing. So going to workshops, getting involved in the community, you're actually sitting right next to Lindsay, who is the queen here in Sacramento of understanding a lot of the different things that are going on in the different opportunities. She's going to a whole bunch of stuff right now because she wants to. She just wants to be involved in this and, and learn what's going on. So start going to stuff. It's about creating that particular network. Yeah, and just in this room, I just want to point out Mariah. She's, she, she has the Founders Institute, so she runs an accelerator program. Uh, Thomas was Clean Start. I have no idea what you do, but you're, you're really, no. <laughs> Thomas was Clean Start is a great resource. I can actually point you out to directions. Uh, and then there's also um, the Big Bang Theory is, is actually kind of concluding for this year. But they start out in the fall, and they actually start out with workshops. That's a program in Davis. Um, so there's lots and lots of resources here. There's lots of people here that want to, you know, see the entrepreneurship uh, community grow. Okay. So uh, now that uh, I guess one question I have for you is, what do you see? What do you plan to do next? What's uh, next on the horizon? So um, I'm not with Sac State as of last Monday. And I am looking at new opportunities. So there are actually several universities right now that have posted up job listings for people doing what it is that I do. Go in and founding centers like this and starting the program with those. So there are several of them across the United States right now. I'm looking at those. I am also still looking at opportunities here in the Sacramento area to see if I can stay here. But I I'm very fortunate in that it's pretty much me and my dog and a few suitcases, well, more than a few suitcases, but me and my dog, and we can go wherever, wherever the wind takes us, wherever the opportunity is, and wherever, this is what speaks to me, wherever there are students that I can wind up helping. So that's always very important to me. So even when I work in private industry, I'm still involved in some way of helping students at all levels, K through college. That's... That's what my richness is. I'm, it's not about money for me. It's about, it's about being able to help students and serve the students. So very much service is, is what I live for. All right, so final question. Who is your favorite superhero? Okay, help me out, y'all. Give me... <laughs> come on, come on. Give, give, give me some... 
Just give me, I was going to say, give me some cool women, superheroes. Wonder Woman, you think Wonder Woman? Black Widow? Okay, a, a compilation of all of the beautiful, brilliant women that are out there that are superheroes, so we've, 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 we've put them all together. That's who my superhero is. There we go. Well, you know, Casey, I just want to thank you for coming here today. Thank you. And you definitely are a superhero. Thank you. Oh, so sweet. Thank you. Welcome to the Startup Grind.